Why Believe in Jesus Christ? Hello and welcome to The Gospel Online. My name is Jake and in this video we'll consider that question to explain why I believe in Jesus Christ and why you should too. So, why believe in Jesus Christ? Now, we could actually interpret that question in a few different ways, couldn't we? So, firstly, why believe in Jesus at all? Why believe that he was a real man who really lived and really existed? Well, we actually have a lot of written evidence that Jesus lived and carried out a ministry of teaching and healing from both Christian and non-Christian sources written within a short time of his life on earth. Of course, the bulk of this evidence can be found within the Bible itself, particularly in the first four books of the New Testament, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. These gospel records tell us about the life of Jesus in great detail, all the way from his birth right through to his death and beyond. They tell us about the things that he did, the message that he taught, the real places that he went to and the real people that he met. They paint a very vivid biography of the man, Jesus Christ, who walked the earth 2000 years ago. But can we trust these biblical accounts? Well, I believe the answer to that is a resounding yes. There is a lot of emphasis in the New Testament on the fact that these writings are eyewitness accounts. These records were written by and contributed to by eyewitnesses. The Gospels of Matthew and John in particular were written by some of Jesus's closest friends. The lists in the Bible of Jesus's 12 closest disciples include both of these men. John, at the conclusion of his gospel and writing about himself, says, This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. His statement is backed up by the fact that we know this record was written a very short time after the life of Jesus. A small fragment of a copy of the Gospel of John has been found, which dates from towards the beginning of the second century, the Rylands fragment, P52. And even though it's only a small fragment, by comparing the writing on both sides, it can be identified as certain as part of John's Gospel. This means we can be certain that the Gospel of John is an eyewitness account. Similarly, Luke starts his gospel as follows. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account most excellent, excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you are instructed. And Peter, generally thought to be a main source for Mark's gospel, writes in his own letter, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And quite apart from these specific statements, the fact that these records were written from four different points of view in great detail and yet are consistent and don't contradict each other gives us a great deal of confidence in the biblical record. Now, of course, when looking at any source of information, we need to consider whether there is any bias there that could potentially make the source unreliable. And of course, it would be fair to point out that the Bible as a Christian source could well have a bias in needing to present Jesus as a real person in order to back up its claims. Now, I absolutely do believe that we can rely on the Gospels, but let's go outside of the Bible as well 
and look at some non-Christian sources to see if Jesus was real. And in fact, to make things harder for ourselves still, let's see if we can find an anti-Christian source from the time of Jesus that presents him as a real person. Well, despite that difficult criteria, believe it or not, there are in fact sources that do meet that criteria. Let's look at just one of them. A Roman called Cornelius Tacitus was a man who was really opposed to the Christians and yet he still recognised that Jesus existed. He was a senator and historian who wrote his annals in around AD 116. And when writing about the fire of Rome, there's this interesting comment. He says about the fire, Nero fastened the guilt on a class of people hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. So we see from the writings of a historian writing shortly after the life of Jesus, someone writing very negatively about the Christians. He in fact goes on to call Christianity evil and a most mischievous superstition. But just in a very matter of fact way, in passing really, mentioning Christ as a very real person after whom the Christians were named. We even get a detail that backs up the Bible record that Jesus was put to death at the hands of Pontius Pilate. And there are other extra biblical sources that we could go to as well. Pliny the Younger, Josephus, Suetonius, to name just a few of them. And if you're interested in, in learning more about those, there are a number of, of gospel online videos that examine these in more detail. So looking at the evidence, we can show beyond reasonable doubt that we can believe that Jesus was a real person. We have eyewitness accounts from those who knew him, as well as the writings of historians from the time, some of whom were actually deeply opposed to his teachings and yet state as fact that Jesus was a real person. So then, having established that Jesus really was a real historical figure, why then believe in Jesus Christ? In other words, that Jesus is the Christ. What makes him special and what makes him fulfil this criteria? Well, first of all, what do we mean by the Christ or the Messiah? Well, if we look back at the Old Testament, time and again, we come across prophecies about a very special man. Someone who was going to be the son of God, in fact, who would reconcile people to God, be a future king in Israel and make great blessings available to everyone. And there are many of these prophecies, but let's just consider a few of them to see if they fit with the life of Jesus. One of the most important prophecies about the Messiah can be found in a series of promises made to a faithful follower of God called Abraham in the book of Genesis. One of these promises can be found in Genesis 22, where we read, Blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So we see that the Messiah would be descended from Abraham and by him, everyone would have the opportunity to be blessed. The Apostle Paul, writing in his letters to the Galatians, confirms this saying, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say unto seeds as of many but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. Similar promises were prophesied to David, the great king of Israel. Reading from 2 Samuel chapter 7, When your days are fulfilled, and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. 
he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. So we see how Christ would also be descended from David and would therefore be the rightful king of Israel and would be the son of God who would build a house or a family for God's name. And we don't have to look far to see these prophecies fulfilled by Jesus. The New Testament opens, in fact, with the words, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew chapter one, verse one, they're arguing right from the outset that Jesus is the Christ by birthright. The rest of the chapter in Matthew then backs up this claim, giving us Jesus's genealogy, tracing it back to David and therefore establishing Jesus's right to be king of the Jews and all the way back to Abraham. And thinking ahead to our time as well, Jesus continues to fulfill these prophecies about the Messiah today. There are followers of Jesus throughout the whole world bearing his name, Christians, showing that all nations of the world have been blessed by him and that Jesus has built a family for God's name. Now, there are many prophecies that speak about the Messiah's life that Jesus fulfilled. For example, Micah chapter 5 tells us how the Christ would be born in Bethlehem. Of course, we all know the famous story of how at Jesus' birth, circumstances arose that meant his family had to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem when his mother was heavily pregnant. And Jesus was then born there in Bethlehem. Another example, Isaiah 61 prophesied that Christ would carry out a ministry of teaching and of healing, which is, of course, what Jesus dedicated his life to. Perhaps the most powerful examples are those passages which foretell the death of Christ, such as Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. If we compare these carefully with the gospel records, we can see how Jesus fulfilled these prophecies in great detail. They predict such specific details as Christ's last words. The exact words of those who would ridicule Christ as he died. His extreme thirst. His pierced hands and feet. The fact that none of his bones were to be broken and that people would cast lots for his clothing at his death. Even such details as the fact that Christ was to be silent at his trial are prophesied in Isaiah 53, that he will be put to death alongside criminals, and that despite this, he would then be buried in the tomb of a rich man. These are all predicted and came to pass in the life of Jesus. Some details he had control over and some were outside of his control. All of them build up to give us evidence that Jesus is the Christ. Most amazingly of all, these prophecies not only predicted the circumstances of Christ's death, but also that he'd be resurrected back to life again. Reading from Psalm 16, Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, the Hebrew word for the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. This passage clearly shows that Christ would die, but would not be allowed to remain in the grave. So who else but Jesus could the Christ be? A man for whom we have evidence of his resurrection from the dead. The eyewitness evidence of the gospel writers that we've considered already. The fact that Jesus's followers were willing to be tortured and die for their testimony of this. Who would be willing to die for such a lie if that's all it was with no benefit to themselves? The fact that despite being under heavily armed guard, Jesus's tomb was found empty 
with the stone of the entrance rolled away, with the authorities unable to produce a body to prove that Jesus was still dead. The evidence for Jesus' resurrection is compelling. And if you'd like to consider the evidence of this further for yourself, the Gospel Online have produced a number of videos putting forward the evidence that Jesus really did rise from the dead. But why believe in Jesus Christ? In other words, why bother? What's the point? We could have looked at any number of historical figures and what made them special. And it would have been very interesting to learn about, but there wouldn't really be anything beyond that, would there? But Jesus is different. Believing in him will change your life. Let's read a very famous verse from the Bible, John 3, verse 16, which many people, even people who aren't Christians, will know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Wow, that's quite a statement, isn't it? That whoever believes in Jesus will not perish, but be given everlasting life. Now that tells us why we should believe in Jesus Christ. Because if we choose to make him so, Jesus Christ can be our saviour. The Bible tells us that the reason why we all die is because all of us have at some point in our lives disobeyed God in some way. No matter how big or small, we've all done it. But because Jesus lived a perfect life, his death has been accepted by God as a sacrifice to remove our sins if we commit our lives to him. He who believes and is baptised will be saved, says Mark in his gospel. Remember we looked at all those prophecies that Jesus fulfilled during his life? Well, there are some prophecies that he didn't fulfill, and that's because he's going to fulfill them in the future. The fact that the Bible's prophecies have come true so far gives us great confidence that the rest will be too. The Bible also tells us that Jesus is going to return to the earth soon to set up and be king over God's kingdom, and judge whether each one of us can have that gift of everlasting life. God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So, why believe in Jesus Christ? Well, all the evidence is there. Believing it will change your life giving you a wonderful hope for the future. If you found this video helpful, please subscribe to The Gospel Online and click the notification bell to keep learning more about the amazing message of the good news about Jesus Christ and the Kingdom of God.